Thank you all for coming today. We would like to present seven pillars of our public safety, community safety proposal. Each one of the pillars has an immediate action step as well as several other proposed actions. Some components of our proposal or action steps you've heard from us many times over the last two and a half years that just haven't happened yet. Some of the ideas are new ideas that came over several community conversations we've had over the past few months. It's a proposal. We've invited many community members to co-create this with us, but we haven't invited everyone. So we are still open to feedback and we're open to changes. All of this is really just to start a different conversation about how we create a safe community and to move us toward meaningful action. I'll hand it off to Joe for the first three pillars. All right. Uh, the first pillar that I'm gonna to touch on is gun violence prevention. Concerns about gun violence in our community are valid and we should be working proactively to interrupt cycles of violence and keep everyone safe. In order to do that, we have to start by engaging those communities who are most affected by gun violence, predominantly victims of domestic and intimate partner violence, communities of color, and poor and working people. Succeeding in this work requires us to acknowledge that those most impacted by gun violence often have deep mistrust of law enforcement, and as a result are unable to work with police on prevention strategies. We must address root causes of violence and support organizations that have the trust of these communities. We must recognize the role that domestic violence plays in gun violence and homicides, with 50% of homicides in Vermont attributed to domestic violence, including recent gun deaths here in Burlington. We also must engage and support local partners who have strong connections with New American and BIPOC youth this is an area where we agree with Mayor Weinberger and we are grateful to Director Carson for taking a leadership role in the newly created City Task Force on Gun Violence Prevention. We hope the task force will consider looking at the CARE Violence model and other community violence interruption models. CARE Violence works at the hyper-local level to reduce gun violence and homicides with the ultimate goal of shifting culture over time. Studies from the Bronx show a near immediate decrease in gun violence with a 63% reduction in shooting victimizations and 37% decline in gun injuries. In Philadelphia, data suggests that implementation of cure violence is responsible for a 30% reduction in the rate of shootings. And the data also show a steady decrease in the number of young people choosing violence. The second pillar that I want to touch on here is uh, increasing capacity for alternative responders. We continue to ask too much of police officers and EMTs here in Burlington, especially with uh, rising uh, cases of uh, mental health crises and uh, overdose that we've seen in recent years. It is not fair to them or to the community to expect police and EMTs to be primary responders to public health crises without the tools or the training to do so adequately. We need trained mental health clinicians, medical support staff with first responder capacity to be able to address acute mental health crises with the goal of reducing harm and using trauma-informed care. That is the purpose of the crisis response team modeled after the CAHOOTS program in Eugene, Oregon. At around 2% of the police department budgets of Eugene and Springfield, CAHOOTS responds to, re responded to nearly 24,000 calls for service and only called for police backup in 311 of those calls. They also saved Eugene eight and a half million in public safety costs and nearly 14 million in ambulance rides and emergency room visits. This model has been partially funded in the past two city budgets uh, at $400,000, but the implementation continues to be delayed as we wait for additional funding to bridge the gap. Given the rise in calls for service related to mental health and overdose as reported by BPD, it's clear that this resource is sorely needed and we need to do everything we can to get that off the ground immediately. Additionally, since 2020, progressives, especially Councillor Hightower, have asked the administration to increase the number of CSLs. We've traditionally had two, we now have three, and the council approved up to six positions. Now the department is in the process of hiring the additional three positions. They've had the funding approved for, uh, since July, since we approved the city budget. So it's long overdue that we get these uh, alternative responders 
um, in the field. Uh, in that budget, we approved uh, additional CSO positions as well. Um, we brought the total number of CSOs up to 12 from 8, and uh, we are seeing these positions uh, be very successful. They have responded to nearly 20% of the incident volume that BPD has seen uh, in the last year. The bottom line is this. Officers acknowledge that they don't have the tools or the training to adequately respond to calls related to homelessness, mental health, and substance use disorders. At the same time, we are seeing these alternative responders have a big impact in the short time that they have been on board. As we've seen in communities like Eugene, Oregon, and Denver, Colorado, increasing resources for alternative responders will have positive and near immediate impact in improving outcomes responding to calls traditionally handled by the police department and the fire department. And I'll hand it off to Councillor Hightower now to go through the next pillars. I'm going to talk through uh, our next two pillars, which are addressing root causes and increasing support survivors and victims of crime. We as a community, as a state, and as a country have been underinvesting in community care for decades. What we're seeing now are the holes in our outdated safety net combined with the stress of COVID. We didn't put care systems into the place, and it shows in the number of people who have fallen through the cracks. We know this is not happening because of the loss of officers in our department. Other departments without a loss are having the same uptick in car theft and gun violence. This is happening across our state and across our country because we've left too many people on the margins who didn't have the means to weather a shock to their life, be it a car breaking down, an injury, an injury or an increase to their rent. Lack of resilience became systemic with the shock of COVID. Doubling down on crime and punishment doesn't help us much in the short term, and it certainly doesn't help us in the medium term or the long term. We can double down on drug dealers. We're not, we could, but we could. But if we don't address addiction, what good have we done? What have we actually fixed? Billions of federal dollars show that we can't war our way into a drug-free America. We can double down on theft, but if we don't address people going into debt due to debt due to health care needs, what have we done? What problem have we solved? We can double down on camping in our city, but if folks have literally nowhere else to go, what, what have we accomplished? Right now we're talking about tough guy false band-aids on the symptoms and leaving the disease untreated. We need to start thinking about the disease. Research is clear that real safety happens when communities invest in taking care of each other and make sure people have what they need to thrive, which is affordable housing, strong public schools, vibrant public spaces, and access to health care, which includes substance misuse treatment and mental health resources. Criminalization is not the answer and never has been. What could we achieve if we spent the 57000 a year that it costs to incarcerate someone on proactive support instead? What if we spent the salaries of the officers we currently don't have on real community care? We need to right now stop doubling down on our old playbook of crime and punishment and integrate plans for reducing bias, housing access, livable wages, corrections reentry, and health care. One of the ways that that looks like is focusing not just on the folks who are doing crime, who are probably also historically victims, but also focusing on victims. The police have only gotten involved if a crime happens and there is a suspect. No suspect or way of obtaining one, no police action. Not historically, not today, and not in the future. But a crime still happened, and it happened to someone. We spend so much time focused on punishment that we, as a society, have chronically undervalued what victims actually really want or need. And they don't always want police action. University of Vermont researcher Kathy Fox noted in VT Digger last year, overwhelmingly, victims report higher degrees of satisfaction with restorative processes than traditional criminal proceedings. Similarly, a 2060 study shows that by a margin of three to one, victims believe prison is more likely to make people commit crimes than to rehabilitate them. Victims seven to one would rather see investments in mental health than jail and four to one in drug treatment. Let's listen to victims and let us support them. If for every $10 we invested in crime and punishment as a society and as a city, we, if we could spend even $1 in making victims whole again, be that fixing a broken car window or providing free access to mental health treatment after violent crime, we would be a different community. 
the 2020 racial justice resolution requested, demanded that we spend the funds of any attrition and BPD on community care. We've had plenty of attrition, but no reinvestment in community care or supporting victims. Let's change that this year. <clears throat> um, I want to talk about transparency and uh, community control. Uh, it's no secret that we've witnessed police excessive use of force against young men of color, officer-involved shootings and fatalities, and scandals that led to the resignation of two police chiefs. Police Commissioner Stephanie Seguino has documented racial disparities for, in police stops for years. This did not start in 2020. And all of this has eroded community trust in the police department, and trust is crucial for public safety, for all of our safety. To restore and maintain trust, we believe there must be greater community oversight and transparency. When the mayor vetoed the community control proposal two years ago, he and others said that the existing near monopoly of power of the chief over, dis over discipline was an aberration in our democratic system. And he promised that they would strengthen the role of our police commission, the existing, which is the existing appointed community oversight body that's embodied in our charter, charter already. But he did not. And it is disappointing that the mayor's next steps to advance public safety did not include a commitment to push for the reforms to strengthen the role of the police commission. It is disappointing that he and the acting chief have taken an adversarial position with the commission. And if you want some specifics, look at the commission's 2022 annual report that they presented to the council on September 19th. And if you look at the, uh, the tape of that footage, you'll see some of us commenting about it as well. To build trust and transparency and fix the monopoly aberration, we should formally strengthen the powers of the commission through the adoption of the ordinance that it requested. And we should also fund the police monitor and staff attorney positions that they have asked for. And I want to now move to address the proposed community control board that thousands, thousands of Burlington voters petitioned for. We supported an independent community control board two years ago, and it passed the council seven to five. So did the ACLU Vermont at that time, and hundreds of Burlington residents spoke in favor of it at that time. It was positive, positively vetted by the National Association for Community Oversight of Law Enforcement, NACOL. The CNA report also supports greater community control in the discipline process. Now, after the veto, thousands of Burlington voters petitioned for the right to vote on an independent board. And we want to say right here and now that we support those voters and we support their oversight proposal and we hope that the voters approve it. Let me speak on a few specifics in relationship to what the mayor criticized about this proposal. The mayor is wrong when he says that the proposal gives exclusive authority to the BPD to a board of, over the BPD to a board of unelected officials. The proposal focuses on investigating discipline in disciplinary problems alone. Supervision, training, deployment, rules and regulations, host of all, all the operations, are still vested in the chief. The police commission still has the oversight over monitoring and auditing that the charter through the council gives it. Fear-mongering. This fear-mongering is just plain wrong. The mayor is wrong when he says the proposal will exclude the chief from all discipline of, the, of department personnel. There's a whole section on the department's powers of investigation and adjudication of complaints. You should check it out. It's right there in the proposal. The fear-mongering is just plain wrong. The mayor is wrong to complain about an unelected board having the power to investigate and discipline police misconduct. 
Look at the diversity of the board and the selection committee for the people who are actually going to be choosing the board. Who among the listed types of people and groups is the mayor afraid of? The board will be appointed. That's just like the existing police commission and every other single commission. The city council and the mayor appoint a selection committee. It's made up of representatives of community-based organizations, but we get to choose them, plus the mayor, plus the REIB director, and a city councilor. I believe that the proposed board is much more democratic and inclusive than vesting absolute authority in the chief, like the current charter does. It's more democratic and inclusive than the current appointment process for commissions that we have right now. Finally, on just making this critique, the mayor's position is wrong in claiming that the uh, proposal will undoubtedly undermine our efforts to rebuild the department and accelerate the department of current officers. One of the problems is that that claim itself can be self-fulfilling. The CNA report speaks to a lack of consensus among BPD members and community stakeholders regarding police services. The attack on this proposal is no way to build consensus. We should embrace a, com a democratic community control over our police department. The proposal simply codifies the principle that the police should not police themselves, but they are accountable to the communities that they serve. I want to focus on the seventh pillar right now, that is the elimination of racial disparities in policing. When we talk about community safety, it's important to make sure that we're talking about safety for everyone. The CNA assessment of the BPD noted what we've known for years now, that data shows racial disparities in BPD traffic stops, traffic stop outcomes, arrests, and use of force. Without eliminating racial bias in policing, many members of our community will continue to avoid calls for service and see the police as a threat rather than a resource. And I would just point you to the seven days warning shot story. It made that absolutely clear. A key reason for the lack of community trust is that BPD still hasn't taken accountability for the ongoing racial disparities in our policing. The last report that was issued by the department doesn't address that, although their data year after year has shown those discrepancies. We need to do better if we're gonna to come together as a community. The BPD must acknowledge the reality of bias in policing. It's telling that one of CNA's recommendations was simply that the BPD consider accepting what local data has shown repeatedly about disparity and traffic stops and use of force. A court, and just to quote, or pretty much quote, the report, key training topics such as procedural justice, implicit bias, fair and impartial policing, restorative justice, response to mental health calls, cultural competency, and de-escalation are either covered insufficiently, not required, or not covered doing either new officer training or annual in-service training. The mayor's position on partnering with the Center for Police Equity does not fully address this problem. It should. We're glad the mayor's plan includes increased training on bias. We're concerned it simply calls for A training. Training has to be ongoing and not, not just a box that gets checked. And finally, we should act on the request by the commission to engage the center in data assessment and propose solutions for departmental racial bias, whether that is intentional or it's implicit or sy systemic. The mayor's plan is silent. The commission asked for this a long time ago. We believe it should be done. Thank you for your attention.
As we've outlined here today and we'll share broadly this afternoon, there are many areas where Burlington can and should choose to lead on public safety transformation. The document that we'll release this afternoon is intended to serve as the foundation for a broader community conversation. We welcome and encourage folks to read it, process it, and provide feedback. This is just the next step in building a community where everyone feels safe, and we are, call we are called to participate in imagining what that looks like. Thank you all, and we'll now take some questions. Um, with the CAHOOTS uh, program that you're hoping to start here, are you waiting for the state funding? Is the department waiting for the state funding to get that underway? Like, what's your understanding of why that isn't happening as quickly as you'd like it to happen? Yeah, so uh, certainly part of it is uh, state funding. Um, you know, I think we, we've known since we were engaged in budget conversations uh, in the late spring and summer last year that uh, the money that we had allocated for it wasn't going to be enough. Um, we passed a budget resolution that called for this program to be off the ground by October 31st. Uh, so I think it is a, it's a mixture of uh, a lack of awareness around capacity to actually get that program off the ground and uh, the state not being as quick with, uh, with funding support as well. And by capacity, we have a community partner who's ready to implement the, the model. We just don't have the final funding to make it happen. In the budget process, we asked, we said, we know we're not allocating enough to this. What's our plan for if the state doesn't come through? Are we ready to fund it? Because we know that we needed this program yesterday. Now we know we don't know when the state funding is coming or if it's coming, and I think we just need to say as a community, we know that we need this. We have to find a way to fund it, even if that is within our own resources. Without the majority on city council, you know, how do you hope that you can get some of these really ambitious measures off the ground and get them, you know, into the well, we've not had a majority in the city council and the whole time I've been here, we've only had um, a half, which always meant that it's the same It's the same strategy. We've always needed another vote to pass anything, um, which continues to be the case. So it's working across the aisle, making um, compromises, finding ways to push things forward. Um, the difficulty maybe with not having half is that we don't have the same leverage to say, this isn't okay, we need you to compromise with us. Um, again, that just means now, also on the other side, not just on passing things, but also on saying no to some of the mayor's initiatives, um, working across the aisle and saying, can you stand with us until we get some of the more important things that we think into the proposal? Can I have a follow-up on, oh, Jeff. I, I was just gonna also note that, you know, many of these proposals that we've been talking about for two and a half years have uh, support from Democrats and independents as well. So, um, you know, progressives aren't standing alone in, in calling for some of these things. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the delays aren't still happening. Uh, let me just add one other thing, which is that if you recall when the Board of Health brought forward the gun resolution asked us to do that, we had had conversations with them, but we, that also included working with uh, Democratic counselors. And it was in that context that we raised, progressives raised, the need for research on gun violence. And I'm happy that the mayor has included this in his uh, proposal that you saw. I totally support that. And it's the type of thing where when we start to float these ideas, they become part of the public process. They become seriously considered. And there is an example where it got picked up. And I'm just really pleased that that was the case. And I think all of these things are things that we'll continue to do in that vein. Follow up to that question is, um, what is the Progressive Party doing to, um, ahead of town meeting day, to elect progressive candidates so that some of these um, initiatives can be enacted? There was fairly low turnout at the caucus. I'm just wondering if some folks could speak to that. Sure, that's because, to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are excited about, I mean, I, we are excited about our candidates. I think we've got a great suite of candidates um, in many of the districts and for the Ward 8 election. Um, 
with my, like, in 2020 was the first time that we got to the half. It's not going to happen for us every time. I'm hopeful that we'll get there again in 2024 and that we'll run those competitive races and try to get at least half of the council again. Um, but again, our, I feel like progressives especially, our power very much rests in people power. So um, that as much means getting folks excited about volunteering and on the doors. We did have progressives still hold the record for the largest um, caucus turnout. So, um, but yeah, I think we're excited to run competitive races. I, I, I would note that the bulk 860 some odd of the, uh, the supposed, I don't know for a fact, but I'll take it um, <laughs> as, as truth, a thousand Democrats came from Ward 5. We, we did pretty darn well when you think when you, if you weigh the numbers up. <laughs> you touched on increasing PSLs and PSOs, which the police department is trying to do now. Do you think that six and twelve are enough? Are we going to see calls for more going forward, or are we just waiting and seeing what happens? I uh, I certainly think that we should be investing in these positions more. Uh, you know, during the budget process um, last year for the current fiscal year, the acting chief came, with, came to the Board of Finance with a proposal that asked for uh, still increases, but smaller increases than we actually ended up with. Uh, and I think the fact that we are seeing uh, CSOs and CSLs responding to such a substantial number of calls with relatively a little lead time in terms of um, how long they've been with the department, I think we're seeing the success uh, already. And these are positions that we can hire much more quickly, we can deploy them much more qu quickly than we can with uniformed officers. So yes, I think we absolutely have to be uh, investing more in those positions. And just to add to that, I think a couple years ago, <laughs> I know there was a progressive counselor that was basically laughed at for proposing unarmed police officer. The fact that we have 10 now um, is a, it's a huge move from that position just a couple of years back. And so I think sustainable growth is going to be important. So definitely make like analyzing the data. We already have the, some of the early data in terms of how many um, calls that those folks can handle basically almost independently and some early data on how much, not just even if they're not doing it independently, how quickly um, an armed police officer can leave the scene after making sure that it is stable and safe and then can have a much more long-term proactive addressing of like okay let's have a conversation about what's going on let's have a community service liaison follow up the next day or the next week or the next month or whatever is needed so yes I think there is opportunities for growth I think we're still waiting for some more additional data on how effective that program is before we expand it and I just want to say it in my work around uh, my, my ward in particular. I've heard folks talk about safety in Pomeroy Park, talk about Roosevelt Park, talk about Battery Park. And when I have raised the question of presence, saying that we need to have presence uniformly, people in those neighborhoods have said that um, having presence does not mean that they have to be armed officers. Park Rangers, CSL, CSOs are all part of a solution because presence is really important. So um, I think that we'll, see, we'll obviously, as Araya said, we'll, we'll see data. But this is something that, from my interactions with folks, people are definitely um, supportive of. And I think it only makes sense in the anecdotal experiences that I've had out there sort of like getting followed by a cop when you're driving. You do tend to slow down. Having people present is, is, a, is, a, is a good thing. Um, in terms of all these priorities today, would you say they are a response to the mayor's conference last week, or were these things that were in the works anyway? How would you describe why today? So I would say it's a mix of both. So we've definitely, over the last year, heard the mayor's tone change from um, transparency, accountability, transformation, to 
rebuild back to normal, um, which are, which so we've, we've heard the shift over the last year. So half of this is a response to that. The other half is we've um, definitely started being more proactive on having community conversations and distilling that into what the themes are that we're hearing and what we really want to prioritize. So um, this is coming out of, you know, feedback and input from a lot of different organizations and folks in the community. Um, and then to some extent it is, so it is a response to what we kind of expected to hear on Friday based on what we've been hearing to the last, over the last year. So we wanted to, we're glad that some of the things that we've been talking about, like being more proactive um, and reaching out to communities who are most affected by gun violence um, and some other things are in the proposal, um, but we, we expected there to be gaps and we're happy to be presenting those gaps. Um, so I guess I have two points on that, which one is we, back when I was on the public safety committee, we had, um, for a long time, we did a whole review of the CNA report and I heard the, one of the, our assigned delegate of reviewing the CNA report from the Burlington Police Officers Association say that they're not opposed to community oversight. And I think... <laughs> Um, which is a different position than the chief, but um, who in that meeting very much said he was very, when we already knew he was very opposed to community oversight. I don't think that this is a universal opposed to. I think that, um, I think that this is the beginning. I think if the department wants to rebuild trust and wants folks to be supportive of the department, this is a great first step. It's just saying having more transparency. I think there can be some compromise and conversation around what that looks like. But um, I think one of the reasons it's hard to be a police officer now is because of the lack of trust. And the lack of trust comes from all of this. And so I think this is actually the start to improving the system, not, um, not, it's not in any way an attack on the officers. Just like when we do a financial audit, it's not an attack on our accountants, it's us doing our due diligence. There's another point that I have, but I'm sure somebody else will say it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I addressed that in my prepared remarks. I, I just think that it, at its basic point, it is fear-mongering that creates a, a tenor which actually reinforces that. So the opposition to that, I think, is, um, is not helpful. Um, I, I, it's, I just don't buy it myself. Oh, I remember my second point, um, which is that the city council has done everything essentially that the police, that the acting chief and the mayor have asked in terms of rebuilding. That's everything from salary increases, bonus increases, um, a really historic kind of um, new union contract that is supportive of officers. and. I, I'm not sure that that's <laughs> getting at some of the problems. I think ultimately the reason it's a hard department to work for is trust. And so we have to start with addressing that. And I think there's other departments in Vermont who aren't having the same issues that we are because we, we, they're, they're committed to transforming and transparency. His, his points in regard to uh, rebuilding that were in his plan of for the, for, the, for, for the most part, with the exception of this one point, seemed to me to make a lot of sense. So um, if you're looking to build uh, a community that's not divided, if you're looking to build consensus, then I believe that we should be um, uh, focused on those things. And I think that there is agreement on it. I don't, well, there's some things that I don't like, um, but I think a big part, for me, I'm more 
focused on the gaps. I think, for example, I think Gene mentioned this in his in his statement, but when the police commission came out with their report, the mayor started the speech on how could they be focusing on bias when we should just be focusing on rebuilding the department. And I was like, Moreau, you're focused on building, rebuilding, that we can't all, like, if you're not focusing on transformation anymore, at least let the police commission focus on transformation. And so I think this for us is as much as about having the other conversation about what makes community safety, which is all of the things that we just talked about. And so um, I'm, I think, less worried about getting rid of some of the things in the mayor's proposal and more worried about having him address a lot of the things that weren't in his proposal. I don't know if the other counselors feel differently, but. He did add the, um, the study, right, for gun violence. That was not part of his thinking before we brought it to his attention and, and, and asked that it be included. So um, I, I, I think, as Zariah said, they have asked and where they have been reasonable, we have given them our support. And so bridging that, I mean, things are a two-way street, right? So, you know, we have put out desires and we hope that uh, they'll be matched with the good faith that uh, we're all trying to, to provide. For the um, sitting city councilors and maybe the council of Hopeful, I'm wondering um, if you could weigh in on how you plan to vote on John Muir's reappointment when that comes up. And if you could say why. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am still a no on uh, confirming acting chief Murad as the permanent chief. Uh, I think council progressives were very clear uh, this time last year when the mayor brought that appointment forward. Uh, we were very clear with uh, what we wanted to see change, to have the department acknowledge that uh, racial disparities still exist and that uh, bias is the, uh, that they're the result of racial bias. Um, I still haven't seen the acting chief uh, take that position and worked proactively to address it. Um, and, you know, we continue to see an adversarial relationship with uh, the police commission. Um, hearing from folks uh, the way uh, the acting chief presents himself uh, is not uh, uh, effort at collaboration uh, with, with folks that all have uh, a very a vested interest in, um, in seeing transformation and progress move forward, and in most cases are willing to have conversations with him to make that happen. Um, and so for those reasons, I am still opposed. And uh, I don't know that there's much that could change that uh, would flip my vote. And I'm gonna add to it just because I have a slightly different position is um, I, a year ago laid out to the mayor the four things that I needed to see, which are very public, I think you've seen them, um, on what I would need to see change. So I, for me, this is as much on the mayor as it is on anybody else as the acting chief supervisor is I just wanted a performance improvement plan <laughs> and some outcomes um, before I, and now a year later, I don't have those things and I'm being asked, maybe asked to have the same vote and my answer won't change until I see the concerns that Joe just laid out being addressed, um, especially on the, I don't think you can ask the current city council to appoint an acting chief who still hasn't said that the racial disparities that we see, that they see in their own data um, are real or um, that isn't willing to create a plan to address some of the confrontational energy, especially when um, experts disagree with him. So I think that's on the mayor to create a plan for that. Um, I am uh, more aligned with Zariah on this one. When I met with the mayor before I uh, uh, was sworn in, um, I said if there was a real commitment to transformation that I would um, be very open to, uh, to changing my position. It was a position that I uh, posted at, on the front porch forum uh, prior to his uh, the, the last uh, appointment vote um, and explained the reasons I have not seen the, the motion 
that's necessary uh, to change that, and I've heard continuing problems um, with regard to demeanor. Um, I am I'm concerned that uh, our police chief, even well-intentioned, even really smart, um, uh, will um, have the the type of relationships and not embrace the uh, the type of transformation that uh, that he has and that we need. Talking about the demeanor and then the transformation. So, at this point, I will not vote yes. Perhaps if he were to hold off and uh, can do, and do that work plan, you know that would you know hope springs eternal and dies last. So. I'm going to make one more point, which is one of the other requirements. Um, what for me was oversight, supporting oversight, as we've to the question of will that affect morale. The the mayor put out his own proposal for oversight that hasn't gone anywhere, but he did put one out um, two years ago. And so I say that at a minimum, if we're having a transformational chief, they have to support the mayor's version of oversight, which I think is a fair bar. Um, which again, like the BPOA seemed open to discussion, and I don't think, I think if we have an acting chief who's um, opposed to any kind of oversight of the police department, that is going to create a, I don't believe in trickle, but a trickle down effect into the officers in terms of how that is perceived as a threat as opposed to as a opportunity. So one thing that strikes me, um, I frequently hear people say that we need to restore the trust that the community had in the police department. Um, and that to me is an incomplete phrase because we need to remember that so many members of our community never felt that trust. They never had that relationship. Um, and so in answering your question, um, you know, I stand with the progressive councilors and the, the progressive party um, with Milo, um, who's also running. Um, but I can't give you an answer right now because I think that community safety really comes down to relationships. Um, if we feel safe in our community, it's because we have strong relationships with our neighbors. Um, we have strong relationships with our institutions. We have trust and we have faith in each other. Um, and so I, I don't want to give you an answer because I haven't talked to acting Chief Murad about it. Um, and I think that it's really important to, uh, to put that faith in, in trying to build a relationship, right? Thanks. Okay. Great, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for our questions and we'll be sending out the full proposal as well as a press release shortly.